We're believing for the next generation church to be readily empowered because of us. And how many know there's some people who need the message we carry? So we want to get that out there. And I actually asked if Brad and Stacia uh, would attend both services. They're on the front row over here. I'm going to have them stand in just a moment. But I want to just tell you um, a little bit of their, their story. Because I, a week ago, Friday night, I attended the Road to Redemption community group. You know, we have all these different community groups meeting. They meet on Friday night, and they, uh, Tiffany Guyton and Chris Goodson, all help lead and facilitate that particular group. Sorry, I'm having a moment here. Um, but they help lead that particular group. And these, these are people who have come out of some pretty um, heinous backgrounds. Most common church people in our society would never interact with a seven-time felon. But I want you to understand, God is able to reach into anybody's life and do the miraculous. The miraculous. And, and I want to just tell you a little bit about Brad and Stacia as they're kind of spearheading. They came to me and they said, we've got to have something resembling the 12-step structure, something to help people who are walking out of this. And so uh, Brad sent me his testimony, and I was so moved by it. I just wanted to tell you that at the age of 12, Brad uh, started going deep into drug addiction. In fact, he was the kid selling drugs in the junior high. And his life would spiral so far out of control, he would be a meth addict that would ultimately be living homeless on the streets. And he and Stacia would meet, and they were both addicted to meth together. That seven-time felon, that was Stacia. Yeah. This, the, that's this couple sitting in this room who are now, listen, eight years sober. Come on, somebody ought to celebrate. Man, we love you guys. Come on. Come on. This is the power of Jesus and the strength of his body functioning together as the church. Come on. We just celebrated in more of that. There is hope for every person on the planet. And that's why we're here. So stretch your hands toward this couple. Father, I just thank you for Brad and for Stacia. I thank you, Lord, for who they are, but also what they represent, that there is nobody too far gone for the love and the power of Jesus Christ to reach into their lives and redeem them. I thank you, Lord, that you redeem our past by surrounding us with people who need to hear our history so it never becomes their destiny, and that's exactly what you're doing with them, and we thank you for it. Amen, amen, amen. Come on. Praise God. Seven-time felon comes to church and tries to hide and hope nobody finds that out. Now, I'm up here talking about it. I want to celebrate. You understand? I want to sell. This is the problem. We, we, in, in the church world that you and I live, we've grown very confused. We've tried to make people religious. Jesus never tried to make anybody religious. We try to make people good. Jesus never tried to make anybody good. Jesus didn't even hang out with good people. Jesus hung out with real people. And what happens in the church world that you and I live in, people get real and we immediately start trying to make them good and everybody gets confused. We all just need to stay real. I don't know if you realize it or not, but you're not as nice as Jesus. And so when you think you're behaving nicely is your representation of Christ, you're falling way short. What you need to do is die to yourself so his life can come on, get right through your surrendered available life. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And I, I don't want to miss the point. Stacia is also uh, going to school now to become a, a drug and alcohol abuse counselor. And, uh, and, of course, leading our redemption group. So I'm so thankful. And I thought of this verse, 2 Corinthians 1.4 in the message. I hadn't started preaching yet, by the way. We're just still celebrating what God does. 2 Corinthians 1.4. Jesus comes alongside us when we go through hard times. How many of you are thankful? It's, it's not on the screen. I know... Kim, I'm sorry you're searching for me. This is just, I'm, I'm, I'm flying. I'm, I'm freestyling up here. <laughs> he comes alongside us when we go through hard times, and before you know it, he brings us alongside someone else who's going through hard times so that we can be there for that person just as Jesus was there for us. And that's the gospel now. But what happens is if you go through hard times, 
and you've had an abortion, and then you come in here and you allow the enemy to shame you into covering up the tool that God now will use if you'll place it in his hand. See, your, your past is not something you should actually be ashamed of. Your past is something you say, God, listen, guys, we're all just on a, we are all just on a journey trying to find our way. And we're a mess. Every one of us, we're a mess. But he's the Messiah, and he turns the mess into a message every single time. If we'll stop hiding the mess and we'll allow him to have his way. And you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And this Saturday morning is about you understanding not only you, but the people around you. And Tracy and I talk often in our early years of our married life, it was really a struggle for us going to marriage counselor after marriage counselor, just trying to keep it together. And I can't even understand that where we were then, because even last night we just laid in bed before we went to sleep, and I just reached over and just held her hand and worship today. I just reached over and just held her hand. I'm so thankful for who she is and the way she is. I just didn't understand it before. I believe this Saturday morning is going to save some marriages, restore some friendships. If you will, invest the time. So I encourage you to try to uh, make it, uh, make it a, a point to be here. So we're walking through our five core values in this season of our church and I just feel God really wants to have a conversation with us to awaken things within us. A purpose not to just go through the typical approach that we've taken. This year I felt there was something a little different God was wanting to do. And so I'm just trying to listen and pay attention to the conversation of the Lord. How many know God is speaking? God is always speaking. And uh, he wants to have a word with us. That's why he sent his son the word to become flesh, that he might have a conversation. He wants to awaken that. If you've given your life to Christ and you've come to know Jesus Christ, that's not the end of it. That's the beginning of it. The word was initiated in your life, and now God's able to have a more uh, clear conversation with you every day of your life for the rest of your life. And let me tell you, there's nothing like knowing Jesus in your daily life, hearing the voice of God. It's crazy amazing. And God wants to awaken that in you. And so this is what I believe God's stirring in our core values, understanding that we bring God's presence to real life. That's what we do. We as a church family, that's kind of our central core idea. We experience God's presence. Man, this morning was worship just rocking. Man, I'm so thankful for our worship team. Come on, give it up for Pastor Christy, the team. Tara, that was awesome, just bringing us in. Not really, give it up for, I'm thankful for people who take us in. They take us in deeper. I'm so appreciative of, of, of the gifts that God's entrusted to our care and helping us to step into those things. And I, I want to just challenge you to recognize and understand as we're walking this out, we are number one, outrageously loving people who passionately pursue the Lord. Those are the first two core values with irrationally giving lifestyles. I'm going to take an approach to talk to you about generosity today, probably different than what uh, you've heard in typical church scenarios, um, be some resembling characteristics, but I want you to get something that's more a broader picture. And so today talking about irrationally giving, let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever sent a text message to somebody and then they did not respond? How many ever cussed? I'm just kidding. You don't have to admit that. I know you did, Regan. <laughs> you send a text message, and then, like, they don't respond. And, man, that just irritates me. And so then, then like, they do send you a text message later when they want something. How many of you ever got that? And then you're looking at the message they sent wanting something, realizing they didn't even respond or pay attention to when you had something you wanted to say, I just want to copy and paste my previous message and send it right back. It's like, my agenda doesn't matter to you, but your agenda matters to you. I wonder if this is how God feels with us. When he's constantly hearing us talk about our agenda to him, but when he wants to have a conversation with us about his agenda, we seem to be ill-responsive. I fear that he feels that way often in my own life. And I want to improve in that area. How about you? I'm going to say this statement. I want you to think about it and really mull this over. God's plan 
is for you to carry an irrationally sacrificial disposition. Irrational. God's plan is for you to carry an irrationally sacrificial disposition that consistently contributes into the existence of others as your personal way of life. This is following the example of Jesus. Anyone, 1 John 2, 6, anyone who claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. How did Jesus walk? He sacrificial even to the point of death to see the kingdom of God expand in the, in the lives of other people. Aren't you glad? It is God's will that you carry an irrationally sacrificial disposition that consistently contributes into the existence of others as your way of life. Others. Others. Everybody say others. Others. Get your mind off of yourself on to others. It will liberate your life. Let me give you a couple of points of advice. Conversationally, stop talking about yourself so much. Conversationally, don't, don't feel like you can get in a conversation and tell everybody how awesome you are. You ever been in a, in a conversation or a relationship where somebody just keeps on one-upping you no matter what you say? They keep bringing one up. One, uh, it's all about them. All about them. Every time you say something, then they one-up. And then you say something again, and they one-up again. Stop talking about yourself so much. Take a genuine, authentic interest in other people. The Bible actually says, he who shows himself friendly will have many friends. It's an interesting Bible verse. It doesn't say, he who works hard to get people to like him will really have a lot of people that like him. If you'll stop trying to get people to like you and just take a genuine interest in others, you'll be blown away at how that is a kingdom mechanism that unlocks something in your life and suddenly people will be around you all the time. People long to be loved. Isn't that amazing? They long to be loved. The very thing in you, you're wanting people to offer you. If you'll extend it to others, it'll come back in your life. It's a kingdom principle. It's important that we understand it. Conversationally, don't talk about yourself so much. Relationally, stop making relationships all about you. How did you make me feel? How did you make me feel? That made me feel. No, how does it make the other person feel? This is something I'm trying to practice. And I just got to tell you, so many times, my own, and it's just good for us to talk openly like this as a church family, my own insecurities and my own immaturities drive me to reactions rather than response. And I'm constantly learning this. The more I get in the Word of God, and the more I get in a place of prayer, and the more I get in private places of worship, letting God do a deep work within me, the less I talk about myself. The more I neglect my personal time with God, the more self-centered and self-absorbed I become. So what I'm trying to practice more and more in my life as I grow deeper and deeper in Christ is whenever I'm trying to come to a place of response to anybody's conversation, I try to start first from their point of reference. Where are they coming from? What are they feeling? Why are they there? Making that relationship not about all me, but about the relationship and the, the connection God's entrusted to our care. So conversationally, don't talk about yourself all the time. Relationally, don't make the relationship all about you. And financially, listen, you have to understand, if you keep chasing the latest and greatest to impress the people around you, you're gonna live yourself financially desperate all the days of your life, and when you find yourself in a place of being financially desperate because you don't have your personal priorities in order, then it's hard to be generous to anybody else except for you. Do you get the key in this whole thing? What's the problem in the midst of it all? And let's just talk a little bit about impressing. Because I shared this story a few years ago, and it's just such a great depiction of how I absolutely missed it. Um, don't, don't settle for impressing anybody, okay? Uh, it, just try not to do it. Just, you'll, never imp you'll never influence people if you try to impress them. You just won't have a level of influence if you're busy trying to impress them. And so I was speaking at a conference one time, and, uh, and it's a funny story. Some of you have heard me <laughs> share it before, but, but John Maxwell was speaking at the conference, and he was the main guy. And so I was speaking in a, in a session that day as they picked him up from the airport, and they brought John Maxwell to the conference. And I'm, I'm up there giving my best, and I see the great author of many best-selling books, walk in the back door like this as I'm speaking. There he comes in and then walks over and they take him to the speaker's quarters. As I'm speaking, John Maxwell comes in the room. So let's, let's just be clear. Let the record show John Maxwell has been under my teaching. I believe he was deeply impacted by that 15-second walk. 
Afterward, I went back into the speaker's quarters and, and there was John. And, and I'm, I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go meet John Maxwell. I mean, do you know who John Maxwell is? I mean, you know him, right? Yeah. And so, so I went over and, and, I, and I said, hi. And he goes, hi, my name's John. I was like, of course you're John. Goes, you know you're John. I'm Lawrence. And he goes, well, hi, Lawrence. Nice to meet you, Lawrence. Lawrence, 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 Lawrence. He used my name like 35 times. I was like, John Maxwell knows my name. And then like after, you know, hours went by and he spoke and different things. I'm standing over in a circle of leaders and he's walking out. They're going to take him back to the airport. And he said this. He walked over to the airport and he goes, nice to meet you, Lawrence. Something about I appreciated the way well, you had to say something. Some, some brief interaction, but he called me by name. I want, you know, I came back to this church ready to preach that Sunday. John Maxwell knows my name. No kidding. Monday morning, I got the CD of the month from John Maxwell. If you sign up and pay the subscription, you get it monthly. And I'd been getting it for a while. I'm not kidding. The day after Sunday, I got in my car, put the CD in. Today... My friend John, I hear his voice. Today I'm going to talk to you about the postman principle. Learn the names of insignificant people. It'll mean a lot to them. <laughs> In that moment, I ejected the CD, threw it out the window, canceled my subscription. I do not like John Maxwell anymore. I broke up with him. What's funny is I was sharing this story in a national conference in England years later, and the president of his association in the UK was in the meeting, and he sent my message to John Maxwell to hear this story. <laughs> and John sent me a book, his next book that came out, to my friend Lawrence. It's over in my office. <laughs> oh... How many of you know it's a trap? <laughs> it is an easy trap to get into. I'm just telling you, it is an easy trap. Every single one of us, we try to act all cool and spiritual and mature. And, and I have met some of the most spiritually mature people who have some of the deepest insecurities. I mean, it's just crazy. Nobody has it all together. And it is such an important element for us to understand in this process of becoming who God's called us to be. We have to stop trying to impress everybody around us. How do we get free from me? How do you get free from you? God has a mechanism he set into place that helps you get free from you. And I want to help you understand it today. It's pretty simple. For God so loved that he gave. Where your treasure is, your heart is. You start putting all this together, and what you find out is it's God's plan for you to actually invest your life into the expression of God's kingdom, awakening something of a deeper desire for him and for others as a result of walking this thing out. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 23, and we're talking about irrationally giving. You need to understand that as an overall lifestyle, and clearly the Bible says in Deuteronomy 14, 23, the purpose of tithing is to teach you to always put God first in your lives. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not in the least bit inhibited, inhibited, nor am I ashamed or embarrassed to stand up and talk to you about your finances and God's plan for your finances. I'm sorry people have hijacked this in the world that we live and they've perverted it, but I want you to know here there's open transparency and accountability on every level as a church family, and this is just an important thing for you to understand. God's plan is for you to put him first. God's plan is to capture your heart, not just to have your attention. God wants your affection, and the way he gains your affection, his, your affection is for you to begin to obey him him and put your treasure in his kingdom so that your heart follows because where your treasure is your heart will go and as you do that and you tithe God begins to see that you have placed him as first priority in your life God knows how destructive it is to be self-absorbed God knows how destructive it is to be self-absorbed this is why giving has always been a part of God's plan for worship. It's just part of the plan. And that word tithe, it's an interesting terminology. It's M-A-A-S-R-A -A -A in the Hebrew language, and it just simply means one-tenth. What this means is to be free from you, God's instituted an action of worship that says every time I increase, 
I literally bring a portion of that increase, the masra, the tithe, the one-tenth, and I bring it before God to the place of the storehouse where individuals like Brad and Stacia are finding hope, where now they're leading a group and other people are finding hope. It's our tithes and our offerings that keep these lights on, build these buildings, enlarge our capacity, our footprint, our influence in this community. It's, it's our tithes that position us where I could go down and sit in the city manager's office and have a relationship with the incoming mayor and have influence in our community and, and Pastor Chris can be the president of the chamber and, and we can continue to walk this out where, folks, we're not just here to pastor a, com- a congregation. We are here to pastor a community, and you are a part of that pastoral power that God wants to release. Come on, why don't you help me celebrate that in and call it in on your own life? God has called you to more than what you may realize. God knows how destructive it is to be self-absorbed. And that's why he's made this a part of it. Every time I increase, I'm face-to-face with this inner turmoil. And it's not easy, is it? You've got to be willing to step back and not allow yourself to be first. You've got to allow yourself not to chase the latest and greatest, or you simply don't have room, margins, for generosity. You you have to understand that element of this. And I, I shared last week, and I just want to reiterate it. When we went away from passing buckets, we will not pass buckets to you today. We did that because we felt God was speaking that we were to take a worshipful approach, help people understand what their giving is really about. And then I had afterward, uh, after we'd done that for a while, a few pastors coming to me saying, so did it work? Did it work? Did did the giving say it work? And what they're saying is, were you able to make budget? And I get that. But I hated the question. It's the wrong question. It's not an issue of do the kingdom fundamentals work? What's an issue is, are we allowing our deepest conviction to produce our greatest devotion in the way we live our lives? And it was my deep conviction It was my deep conviction that we not stand up and arm twist every Sunday after Sunday. Now the buckets are going to come by and you know, sometimes it's just like you're right there face to face. I know there's never going to be a a perfect way to make this happen, but I just want you to know you're in a place where we want to honor Jesus and we want to empower you so that you might know your God. We might see the kingdom expand and more people will come to know Christ as a result of our doing things in a way that brings glory and honor to God and dignity into the lives of other people. So listen, don't Don't require me in society, in the culture in which we live, to give you some teaching about how beneficial it is for you to sacrifice of yourself and bring your tithe before the Lord. Don't require that of me. That's too surface. That's too immature. This is not about that. This is not about you getting more of what you want. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over. I understand the blessing that comes when we give, but it's not about you chasing the blessing. It's about you being free from you so you can chase your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and then the blessing will chase you down. The blessing is not the pursuit. The blessing is the result. Jesus is the pursuit. We live in a society where people just require this immature expression where we dress the the pursuits up in result form. And you're chasing the wrong thing. Chasing... The wrong thing. Our deepest conviction should produce our greatest devotion. Giving is about being a responsible part of the church family. But listen, it's so much more than that. God designed you with giving in mind. Here's a big statement. You will malfunction in every area of your life that lacks the principle of giving. Do you believe what I just said? You will malfunction. Relationally, you will malfunction. You remember what we were talking about? Getting people to like me? As opposed to giving what you're, what, what you're hoping people will give you. Just give that into the lives of others. Your relationships begin to malfunction. Your finances begin to malfunction. A lot of things within you begin to implode because you were designed by God with giving and loving in mind. Dr. Carl Menninger said, giving money is a very good criterion of a person's mental health. Generous people are rarely mentally ill. Isn't that crazy? That's like, uh, no pun intended, but you understand what I'm saying. I mean, that's bizarre. I, I look at that, that stat, and I, I mean, I just think it's bizarre. You, know, you ever know somebody who's self-absorbed? Do you think of somebody, when I say an individual who's self-absorbed, you know, if you, if you can think of somebody like that, you know just how toxic and unhealthy they are in general. And, and this is important. 
We're all, we're all in alignment. We're all in agreement. But let me just take you to another level of importance in this regard. Your children are never going to learn generosity from their buddies. How many of you believe your children will be better off in their marriages if they can learn selflessness at an early age? That's why, not because I'm a pastor, but that's why we've taught our children, Faith and Lexi, the important principle of the tithe. Not the law, not the requirement, but the worshipful expression of every time we increase. We surrender that to the Lord as a lifestyle of being free from me. And what that does is awaken something in the heart of a person that takes them into a place that will cause them to be so much healthier. Your kids are impacted by your actions, so include your children in this important part of your life. Your action point this week. We bring God's presence to real life. Your action point is simply this purpose of family conversation about tithing and how you put God first in your family, in your life, in your home. It's going to look different for every person. In our community groups, in the first 40 days of the year, we always take this approach, walking through our five core values in our community groups. We have those discussions. This is an important part of the journey of becoming a member of our church family. I would invite you to find a community group this week because part of the discussion is going to be, what does this look like for you? Did you have this growing up? And if you did, are you going to repeat that or are you going to alter that? Did you have this growing up? And if you didn't, what will it look like? You just start to kind of flesh this out, have a conversation so we can understand how to truly put this into action. And, and one more deeper level. Some dreams, I hope you'll really hear this. <clears throat> I mean, even though it's not just about having dreams on behalf of God. It's about surrendering to the very dreams of God that will enlarge the core of your existence. Like, God has so much in store for you. You know, there was this dude that was strung out on meth, living on the streets, didn't even have a home to go to. God was looking at his life saying, you know, I think I can use you, not just to get you free, but to make you into a freedom fighter, making other people free. And here Brad sits. I mean, God has dreams. There's no way that guy could have dreamed what's going on today. There's no way you can dream right now what God has in store for you five years from now. Some dreams simply cannot come to pass by natural means. Are you hearing me? Your sheer determination is simply not enough. This is not about religious organization and nice motivational positive messages. This is about spiritual impartation and revelation from heaven that gets awakened in your heart and enlarges you beyond the borders of where you ever thought you could go. It is not over. It is not ended. Hannah, it is not over. It is not ended. God is taking you into greater places than you've ever known. The dream is not dead. God's reviving it in your life. Sometimes we think circumstances cause it all to be acquitted around us. It hasn't. God hasn't given up. But listen to me and hear me loud and clear. Many dreams do not come to pass by natural means. And this is why God's plan involves spiritual disciplines that release supernatural abilities to your life and to your legacy. I want you to know, not because I want you to be impressed. I'm a praying man. I've pressed in to learn more in the last year about what it is to truly pray and experience God in deep places of intercession in the last year more than I've ever known before. And what's going on is there is a legacy attachment to these two girls that are sitting on this front row. And my spiritual life is making an impact on who they will become. And it's not all up to me, but there is a contribution and a responsibility that I have. And when I reach over and take my wife by the hand, and we just say simple prayers, Lord, bless our girls. Let them hear your voice. Let them know the Spirit of God in their everyday lives. There is something powerful being released in that moment in time. This is who God has called us to be. We are influencers. How many of you just say... Let's agree for 2019 to be a year of complete and total financial turnaround in your life. How many of you would agree? Let's agree for that. Let's include God's in our financial framework. 
Let's pay attention to what he says in his word and watch and see what he will do. We've learned it all year, 2018. God wants your life to be awesome. I said this dozens and dozens of times in 2018. God wants your life to be awesome, but that truth comes with a trick. The truth is he wants your life to be awesome. The trick is he doesn't want you to pursue an awesome life for yourself. He wants you to provide an awesome life for others. Now that will make your life awesome. It's a principle of generosity. It'll transform everything about your life. Now, I hope you're motivated to give. You, you probably didn't hear me at my heart. I hope you're motivated to give. Not because we are finished in the kids' area. and I mean, six to eight weeks, I think we'll be in there. <clears throat> Definitely before Easter. Isn't that exciting? That's awesome. Only $56,000 to go. I, uh, Howard, I'd like to borrow your checkbook. I have faith all of a sudden rising up in my heart. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about any of that. I hope you're motivated to give. But I don't want you... Let me pastor you for a moment in this. I don't want you to get up out of your seat and go find a giving station today and give compulsively. I want you to be deeper than that. I want you to pray about the routine and the rhythm that God's trying to establish in your life. Function in that out of maturity. I'm not trying to talk you out of your rent. I want you to grow deeper. Our goal here is that we make disciples, not just attract attenders. And sometimes it's a little bit in your face, the approach we take. But you know what? I'm going to answer to God with the approach that we take as a church family. And I want you to be everything God's called you to be. If I have any opportunity at all to take you deeper, I want to do that in Jesus' mighty name, that we might become the people that he's called us to be. Your selfless journey begins first with a cross. It's not your own cross. It's the cross of Jesus Christ. And then when you come face to face with the cross of Jesus Christ and you say, yeah, I agree. Jesus came as the Savior of the world, the Messiah who came to rescue all humanity and redeem us from our sins. Then you're saved. And then you're introduced to your own cross. And then you begin to learn what it is to live a sacrificial life on behalf of others just like Jesus did for you. Have you come to know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Have you surrendered yourself at the cross of Christ for the sacrifice that he made for you? Jesus didn't die so we could go to church. Jesus died so we could be the church. We are the church. You can't go to church. You are the church. Let's be the church. Are you involved and engaged in your church family or are you an attender? Because I'm just going to tell you, you'll never be spiritually mature if you don't go deep in the family of God. It's just the plan of God. It's not mine. It's not good for man to be alone. Iron sharpens iron, and so one man sharpens another. Therefore, if we decide to have independent Christianity isolated away from others, we'll simply never be spiritually sharp, and God wants more for you than that. So do you need to engage on a level of really finding your place in the body of Christ? Some of you do. Do you understand what it was when you walked through baptismal waters? Because we believe as the Israelites came out of the bondage of Egypt and they passed through the waters, everything that had held them captive and their previous uh, generations captive perished in the water that day chasing them in the, and they came out and they were completely free they weren't dancing with their addictions their, their addictions were completely destroyed in the water that day listen that's the kind of faith we have for what's going to happen this Sunday night as people pass through these waters we are serving notice on the devil we're declaring the old is gone everything is new and Jesus is awakening something in the nature of humanity out of the very heart of God in Jesus mighty name Three things, salvation, church family, baptism. How many of you need to respond and take a step in one of those three areas? Let me just see your hand. Just hold, hold be honest. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Yep, yep. Come on, let's all just pray this prayer. Everyone say this out loud with me, everyone in the room. Lord Jesus, none of us have it all figured out. But you do. You're God. You're the Savior. You came, you lived, you died. But come on, say this real loud. You are alive. Awaken us today as we surrender our lives more completely to you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Come on, let's give him a standing ovation.